Hi everyone. Okay, Spike Saros, you were saying. First, he ultimately, if he's a consistent atheist, which none of them are, winds up having to deny any reason for physics to be, to be true in the first place. If by physics being true you mean that nature can be described in terms of descriptive laws that at least appear to apply consistently, then the only justification we need is the empirical observation that, yes, it can be, and that such descriptions turn out to be practically useful to us. And then has to deny the laws of physics themselves. So let's talk about each one of those. So if an atheist is really going to be an atheist and think it all the way through, he has no reason to expect laws of the universe to even be operating in the universe today, does he? Now, of course, if you talk to an atheist and mention that, he'll say, well, we know the universe operates according to laws of physics, so we can assume that they exist. Well, I agree that they exist, Mr. Atheist. The question is, how can they exist? Why should they exist? Because we wanted to describe the behavior of nature, so we did. My worldview explains why they exist. Your worldview, really consistently, would say they don't. So, atheists can't describe things? You really have no clue what you're talking about, do you? So we see that an atheistic cosmology denies any reason for physics to even be true anyway, but then it goes further and actually denies those laws of physics that we have. How does it do that? Well, let's talk about math for a minute. And I probably just lost half of the audience here, but that's okay, because this is actually very interesting. Mathematics has been called the language of physics. And if you ever take a physics class, you'll know that pretty much everything you ever write on a piece of paper is a mathematical equation of some sort, right? Math is how physics is expressed. The laws of physics are all mathematical equations. And if I said earlier physics is the fundamental science and tells us how the universe operates, and if math is the language of physics, then math is really the language of the universe, isn't it? No, math is the language used by humans to describe the universe. The air you're breathing right now, going in and out of your lungs, is obeying the mathematical laws of statistical mechanics. The blood flowing in your veins is obeying the mathematics of fluid dynamics. When we say that something obeys descriptive laws, what we mean is that its behavior can be described accurately by such laws. It's just a figure of speech. And if you look at the history of this, up until the Enlightenment, more or less, people understood math was something God had built into the universe, and it's our privilege and joy to go discover it. And they were wrong. Since the Enlightenment, most people don't want there to be a God anymore. So what then is mathematics? It's no longer something God built into the universe. It's no longer something we discover. Instead, it's something we invent. And it always has been. Some among secular thinkers now, most would say mathematics isn't discovered, it's invented. It's just a fundamental game that mathematicians and scientists play. It's an art form kind of like poetry or music. Okay, so two and two no longer equal four, absolutely. Because two is just something we made up, that when added to itself, we defined it as something that produces four. Well, not quite, but yeah, two plus two equals four is a true statement because of rules that we've made up, yes. Simply put, we observe that discrete, finite sets of things, like the cows in that field over there, or the apples in this basket, have what we call cardinality. The cardinality of a set is simply the answer to the question, how many are there? We give names to the different cardinalities, and those names are what we refer to as natural numbers, one, two, three, and so on. Addition is the operation we perform when we ask how many are there in these sets put together. That is, a sum is the cardinality of a union of sets. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is only a true statement in the sense that it is mathematically correct. It is consistent with these definitions. We can expand the definition of addition to allow for addition of fractions as well, and if we do this, 0.9c plus 0.2c equals 1.1c, where c is the speed of light, is also a mathematically correct statement. Yet we know from special relativity that velocities don't add that way. So here we have a mathematically correct but still false statement. It's analogous to how dogs have wings is a statement which is perfectly consistent with the rules of the English language, but it's not an accurate description of the reality we observe, so it's false. 
but you could just as easily define it as something that when added to itself produces the square root of 37. Definition. 2 is defined as 0.5 times the square root of 37. I can do it. Now, I don't ever intend to use this definition because the old definition of 2 is so well established, but the universe didn't implode and no magical force of math prevented me from speaking the definition. What the hell were you expecting? Specifically, James Clerk Maxwell in the year 1873 wrote a two-volume book where he summarized everything that was understood of elect static electricity, uh, alternating current, magnetism, a bunch of other phenomena, all into one mathematical framework. It took 10 years for George Francis Fitzgerald to even understand some of the implications and said, you know, if Maxwell's right, he published two papers on this, if Maxwell's right, we should see energy loss as alternating currents go through a wire. We should see the current lose energy into the surrounding medium. And then five years later, Heinrich Hertz in a famous experiment verified that that loss was taking place. And we now call that radiation of energy radio waves. Okay, think about that. If Maxwell's equations are just some poems that Maxwell wrote, why is the universe obligated to obey Maxwell's poetry? It isn't. The poetry describes an aspect of the universe, and a logical consequence of that description is that radio waves should exist. Now, if they didn't, then the poem would have been wrong, and it would have been rewritten to reflect that. So in effect, it's the poem, or rather the poet, who obeys the universe, not the other way around. Consider this analogy. I take a trip to location A. I see a river running south. I then take a trip to B, south of there, and I see a river there as well, also running south. I draw a map of what I think the area between A and B should look like, and you know what? I suspect there's a river there somewhere. In fact, I'm going to make the prediction that if I go in a straight line from C to D, I'll have to cross a river. Now, if I take that trip and I indeed have to cross a river, would you say that map making can't be a human invention but must have been built into the universe by a deity simply because otherwise the world wouldn't obey the map? If you don't think that sounds stupid, I don't think I can help you. Ultimately, all atheism can offer is this. Though devoid of truth, mathematics has given man miraculous power over nature. This is the greatest paradox in human thought. Think about this. So uh, this is a good summation of where atheism must take you if you're actually going to take your atheism to its logical conclusion. No, that's a statement about math, not atheism. It's true whether a god exists or not. And atheism can't take anyone anywhere. It's a lack of belief in gods. That's it. Atheists are not led by their atheism, they are simply not led by some religious dogma. Taking the bus will take you somewhere, namely where the bus goes. Not taking the bus won't take you anywhere, but it will mean that you are free to go places where the bus doesn't go. That's the point. Well, if mathematics is devoid of truth, then mathematical equations are all devoid of truth. But the laws of physics are all mathematical equations. So the laws of physics are devoid of truth, and you've just denied all of science. What? That's it? That's your punchline? A fallacy of composition? Okay, let's try this again. Math is a descriptive language. The truth is in the description, not in the language itself. In order to talk about truth, as in an accurate representation of some reality, then we need two things. We need a reality to describe, and we need a description, typically in the form of a statement about that reality. If all we have is a language, then we have no truth, we just have the means to produce statements which may be true or false. Now, an equation is a statement, and if it's a statement about some reality, 
then we can compare the statement to that reality and we can say whether it's accurate, true, or not. False. If you're going to be an atheist and, re and really be an atheist and take it to all the way to where it goes, you're going to wind up denying that laws of physics even exist. I'm sorry, but what the hell does this have to do with atheism? Adding an invisible wizard to it doesn't change anything. Truth is still not found in languages, but in descriptions of reality made using languages. This is true whether God exists or not. Math is man-made whether God exists or not. Laws of nature are descriptive whether God exists or not. An atheist would object that, well, we know mathematics works and that it helps us comprehend the universe. Well, Mr. Atheist, I know it works. That's because the Bible's true. That's because there is a creator who created mathematics and built it into the universe. And that's why we can discover it. We only discover mathematics in the sense that we come to understand previously unknown consequences of our made-up definitions and axioms. And we also discover new uses for them. That's it. Many people have noticed in history, they ask the question, you know, why is it that Europe colonized so much of the world? Well, they colonized so much of the world because they were technologically more advanced at that time than most of the rest of the world. Why is that? Because those, sci those men, those scientists, believed in the Bible. I don't know, that may actually be partly true. Back in those days, priests were scholars. They studied fields other than theology. But this says nothing about the truth of Christianity, because all of this was before science started seriously contradicting scripture. Today, a Christian science enthusiast will eventually come to a point where he has to make a choice between following his faith and following the evidence, because they don't lead to the same place. Christianity has always viewed science, and before that, natural philosophy, as a useful form of apologetics, when it fits with Christian doctrine. But when it doesn't, well, let's just say there's a reason why fundies homeschool their kids. To keep them away from real science, so they won't learn that the Earth is more than 6,000 years old. And round. To be continued. See ya.